Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce Shutan. Our special guest today is Susan Thornton. She's a senior fellow and visiting lecturer at Yale University's Paul Tsai China Center. Susan, it is such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for spending time with us. Thanks, Bruce. Good to be here. So you have tremendous experience uh, with diplomacy and policy making across Asia. I'm wondering what are the three biggest issues, would you say, uh, confronting the region today? Wow, well, Asia is a big region, of course, and there are a lot of challenges. Um, I think, you know, for much of the last several centuries, actually, Asia has been lucky enough, or maybe through their own efforts, um, diligent enough to avoid a major cataclysmic, you know, major power conflict there, which is not easy because a lot of the world's major powers are centered in and around uh, Asia. Uh, but I think, you know, the most important thing for Asia is to be able to continue that kind of peaceful environment in which they can thrive and avoid conflicts, which do seem to be sort of uh, lurking at least off stage in the shadows, if not coming a little bit even closer than that. Um, of course, you know, the reason why you want to avoid conflict in part is to avoid catastrophe, but also provide that environment for something else that I think Asia is really in need of, which is continued development, um, economic and societal development, and also the development of their governance structures um, and moving more and more into a sort of good governance sphere that is responsive to the needs of people. And then of course, uh, the elephant in the room that I haven't mentioned, but is always uh, right up there at the top of the agenda when US officials go out to Asia to talk to people is the threat of climate change. And I think this is felt very acutely in many, many countries in Asia and it is, um, you know, alongside this development agenda, which most of the countries in the region share, uh, the threat from climate change is one of their of their top concerns. Sure, I would say in Beijing, especially uh, a major concern in India as well, of course. Pacific uh, Island states. <laughs> yes, and, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of maritime, low lying maritime states in Asia as well, Southeast Asia, yeah. Absolutely. So switching gears for a moment, um, there are uh, anywhere from 200 uh, million to 300 million people uh, in East Asia who are in extreme poverty. Um, how urgent is it that uh, uh, international organizations and national uh, governments address this issue, do you think? I mean, I do think that the national governments in East Asia are pretty focused on the issue of development. Of course, this is you know a longstanding issue, er uh, poverty eradication in this region. Uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, though, that the East Asian governments have done a tremendous job in lifting people out of poverty over the last several decades. Uh, I think the World Bank estimates that 750 million people have been lifted out of poverty. Um, a lot of that is due to, of course, the miraculous economic developments in China. But let's not forget that before China, there were the Asian tigers. And before the Asian tigers, there was a the development in Japan. And so we really have seen this kind of inexorable rise in living standards and well-being across much of East Asia in the last you know, four or five uh, decades. And I think um, you know, what has to still be done, obviously, is to continue this work. Uh, we need sustainable kind of long term solutions to tackle the problem and make sure it doesn't creep back in. I think um, the peaceful environment that I talked about earlier is very important. But a lot of the problems now in East Asia, I think about eradicating, you know, uh, the 200 to 300 million people who are currently living um, you know, eradicating poverty for that group is going to have to be uh, coming through uh, governance solutions. In other words, we need to do a much better job of ensuring that there are uh, fair efforts at sort of distribution of income issues and how governments are getting at distribution of 
wealth within societies as well as across national borders. And those things are, are hard. Um, you know, even the developed countries, the United States, for example, we're struggling with this ourselves now and sort of how to deal with inequality and persistent kind of um, underclasses uh, and how to get them to have opportunities to, to rise up in, um, in, within, our, within our societies and um, make sure that they are given the right opportunities. So I think these are really hard things to do. Um, you know, one of the factors has to do with sort of good governance and how much of a say these, you know, sort of people that are living in poverty, how much of a say they have in changing their own situation and um, how much is invested in human capital in these countries, et cetera. So, I think um, you know they've done a good job. More needs to be done. The international organizations can help, but it's really at the end of the day going to be on national governments um, improving their uh, kind of uh, approaches to the problem, and also uh, making sure that people get opportunities. I'd like to tie together uh, two of the issues that you had just addressed. Um, in a unique way, <clears throat> uh, we were talking earlier about uh, global warming, um, climate change. Um, Bangladesh and Pakistan also are a couple of uh, countries where they're uh, the biggest polluters in the world. How does air and um, water pollution uh, affect poverty across the region, uh, as well as growth rates? And what can be done to alleviate, help alleviate these challenges? Yeah, I do think that there is a pretty clear connection between sort of those living in poverty and also environmental problems. And usually when there are environmental problems in a country, the people who end up being most affected by those um, are the people that have the least ability to sort of change that situation, uh, people that are living, um, you know, just on the edge. So, you know, clearly environmental problems are going to be a huge drag on opportunities for these people for growth in general. And I think um, the biggest problem is really going to be sustainable development. In other words, you want countries to, at this point in the 21st century, you want them to be able to leapfrog over that dirty industrialization period that pretty much all countries up to now have had to go through in their development trajectory. And um, the problem with that is you need technology to do it and the technology needs to be affordable. A lot of these governments, you know, don't have the money to spend on the latest technology um, and they don't wanna sacrifice their development opportunities either um, in order to take care of environmental problems. So you've got to come up with a solution where it's both pro-development and pro-environment. And I know we're working you know, very hard now in the global community to come up with those solutions, but a lot of them aren't ready for prime time yet. And even when they're ready for prime time, they might be um, expensive and out of reach for some of these countries. And that's where this financing from the developed world um, and from other donors is going to come in to allow these countries to afford to leapfrog over the, you know, dirty industrial development phase to try to create new opportunities and connectivity and societal investment that doesn't uh, along the way, um, you know, ponder this problem of, you know, where developing countries have been seen as a kind of a dumping ground for outsourcing, you know, dirty production. So I think, you know, green technologies should help with this. We also need enlightened leadership and governance um, from not just the governments themselves, but also from industry and the private sector, um, also from civil society. It kind of needs to be a whole of society approach. And that sometimes can be very hard to do, especially in developing countries where you're dealing with um, you know, questions and problems of, of poverty and, and very kind of um, fragile situations oftentimes. What do you see as the infrastructure needs of poor nations? 
Well, there's, I'm not a development economist. I should qualify my answer on this, but um, I am very interested in this question. I've talked to a lot of development economists and seen a lot of these developments as I've lived in various, you know, developing countries in my career as a diplomat for 30 years. Um, and what I think is the crucial ingredient is the investment in human capital. Um, we really need to make sure that governments are prioritizing investment in education, um, health care, and also in sort of, you know, giving people opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship. I think those are the real key ingredients. Of course, um, promoting opportunity is going to be key. And that's where the good governance comes in. And I think only, you know, next in line would be the physical infrastructure. I mean, once you've got people educated and healthy and with opportunities, then you need the physical infrastructure that can connect them to uh, markets and opportunities and um, other, other prospects that will further develop their ideas and their uh, potential. But um, I think that the human capital investment is, is really key. I'm going to talk a little bit more about climate change. Um, how do you see it affecting the wealth of Asian nations in terms of subsistence farming and food, uh, catastrophic storms and lowland flooding, uh, an increase in the duration and the intensity of heat waves, um, and so on and so forth? These are great questions. And um, I'll just interject here briefly. I currently live on a farm in Maine in the United States. Um, we are growing organic vegetables here and we have livestock and animals. And Maine is a part of the United States that is traditionally viewed as having a continental and tending toward a sort of colder climate than much of the rest of the country. And we've seen just since I've been living here for the last five years, you know, pretty dramatic swings in weather patterns that are not normal for this part of the country. And we're blessed in the United States, of course, with this continental climate, we have pretty even rainfall, you know, we have storms and flooding and hurricanes and other things like that. But um, in other parts of the world, the weather, weather patterns are so different from the United States and Asia is one of those where there's a, a dry season and a monsoon season. And so the agriculture and food security um, in many countries in Asia is a lot more precarious, of course, than it is in the United States. And you see these swings in weather uh, getting more dramatic. Uh, things have become a lot more difficult for farmers. And I think, um, you know, as climate change progresses, if we don't act quickly and urgently to do something drastic, um, we're going to see, you know, places that are quite precarious fall into even greater kind of peril and fragility. Um, you know, China, uh, just to take one example, is the number one food importer in the world. Of course, there's 1.4 billion people and uh, they have a huge agricultural sector there, but they're not able to produce enough food um, if, to feed the population. And there are many other very populous countries in Asia uh, Indonesia, India, that are going to be very subject to climate changes and impacts on their agriculture. And we're already seeing it in some of these places. Um, I think, you know, this is going to be something that the international community is going to have to take up. It's been brought up recently because of the war in Ukraine and the, and the impact of that on sort of global grain commodities in the near term. So that has kind of woken people up to this issue, but this is issue is gonna be persistent. What strategies do you think could be put in place, especially considering China uh, becoming increasingly isolated from the West? Well, I think one area of continuing US-China discussions and um, constructive kind of collaboration is the area of climate change. Uh, we were doing a lot more together on climate change about you know five or six years ago. And a lot of that 
uh, you know, on the ground cooperation was halted under the Trump administration in the United States, but we still have, I think, a recognized common interest between China and the United States to, to collaborate, to coordinate on our policies, to try to, um, you know, make sure that we're both uh, showing responsible commitments and, and targets and that we try to push each other to do better. Um, I wish we were doing more together. Uh, I think that, you know, we do need to do a lot more work on incentives for climate change in Asia. And, you know, they are, there is a kind of a, um, uh, you know, contradiction, I think, on the part of many governments in Asia, especially those that are still developing and have that as their priority goal are worried that they're gonna to have to sacrifice some development for um, climate change mitigation and adaptation purposes. And they're very worried about that. And that's a disincentive for them to pursue climate strategies that will be helpful. And we need to make up for that. So the Chinese have a South-South Cooperation Fund on climate change. They are giving donations to countries to help them make these transitions. The US and other developed countries are contributing to the Green Climate Fund we have to make sure that we pony up for our contributions. And I really think um, making polluters pay is the right answer. It's the thing that makes the most sense for me. Uh, the reason it doesn't actually uh, get done, I think most people would agree it's the right answer, but it doesn't get done because it's politically difficult. And there are a lot of vested interests that are resistant to that. It would change cost structures of many things, obviously. Um, and so, you know, there have been efforts to work with China on a cap and trade sort of carbon trading market, which gets you partway there. Uh, the Europeans have been very actively involved with China on that. And I think more could be done in other countries in that vein. I mean, people are focused on China and India because they're the biggest sort of polluters. And, and China, of course, is the biggest target in this respect um, and needs to do to more uh, to make a difference than the others. But, you know, all the countries in Asia could use help in these areas. You know, aside from climate change, what would you say are some of the hardest issues uh, between China and the U.S. to work on? The hardest issues? Um, well, some of the, you know, the easier issues. I mean, I would say climate change is an easier issue. It's been basically recognized by publics in both countries in spite of our kind of deteriorating relations as something we need to work on. And I would say those transnational issues tend to be in that space. A uh, big, huge disappointment was that we were not able to work together on the pandemic response and the global response as a result of the politicization of that pandemic was a disaster in my view and in the view of most people that I talked to and who, who know what happened and were involved in it. Um, and we've got to make sure that we repair that before the next pandemic. Um, it's not going to be very easy because we've sown a lot of mistrust now over this current one. And we've got to get through the current one first, of course. Um, and we're not there yet. But um, transnational issues like, like health uh, challenges, like uh, environmental challenges, um, like the challenges that come from sort of cross-border crimes. I'm thinking of things like combating drug trafficking and other things like that. Those are a little bit harder, but those are things that most people agree we need to work on together with other countries, including China. We can't exclude China because they're such an important player. Um, as the Europeans would call them, they're a partner of, of necessity. And, um, and I think we have to reconcile ourselves to that. Um, I think we've worked well with China in the past on regional conflicts outside of Asia. Um, South Sudan comes to mind as one where the Chinese have, you know, deployed peacekeepers and worked very hard on kind of a regional um, settlement to end a civil war there. Uh, so in some other cases, we've worked with them on peace process in the Middle East or other conflicts in Africa. Um, of course, we, we do work together with China on conflicts within the region, the Asia region as well. Of course, North Korea comes to mind there. Um, we're not doing much on North Korea with China at the moment, but in the past, we've worked uh, closely with them. And we're also, of course, working very closely with China on the Iran 
negotiation to try to reestablish the agreement on the curbing their nuclear program. So, so China has been a big player on all those issues. The harder ones are the bilateral security issues, um, issues in Asia having to do with kind of maritime boundaries, um, movement of military forces, um, anything military to military in Asia tends to be fairly fraught. And of course, the issue with Taiwan, which is the most difficult issue uh, going all the way back to the negotiations that Nixon and Henry Kissinger engaged in in the early 70s, um, that issue is still with us today and it's, it's extremely difficult and sensitive. No doubt. I want to go back to North Korea for a moment. What can South Korea, the US, Japan and other nations do to try to engage the country? Uh, and what do you think are the chances of developing uh, a diplomatic solution? Certainly Donald Trump, to his credit, made that attempt, uh, but uh, nothing has really ever come of it. Yeah, it's a really difficult problem. I was working in the State Department on the Korea desk in 1997 through 99 when we actually were um, had come up with an agreement called the Agreed Framework. We prepared the trip for then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright to go to Pyongyang, which she did, and we thought we were going to be able to, um, you know, get a satisfactory resolution, but then sort of uh, found out North Korea was uh, cheating on the agreement and trust fell apart and we got into this cycle of mutual recriminations. And we've tried to restart these negotiations and re-initiate uh, a denuclearization process with North Korea several times since. And it's just every time, um, you know, something's happened to sow mistrust, um, you know, that the North Koreans clearly are reluctant to give up their nuclear deterrent uh, and have a lot of their own security concerns, um, whether we consider them valid or not, uh, it almost doesn't matter, that's their perspective. And they've managed to create a state that is wholly uh, independent from outside kind of influence and um, you know, punishment. And they've been under sanctions now for three decades or more. And um, even under COVID, you know, they sealed off their own borders to outside trade and have managed to keep things afloat since then. So, uh, I mean, it's really hard to see how we're going to influence the regime in Pyongyang. Uh, I think, you know, we do have to think hard about what our next diplomatic steps are. I agree with you that, you know, um, there were a lot of critics of Donald Trump's approach to the North Korea problem, meeting with the dictator Kim Jong-un gives him legitimacy. But on the other hand, he is the main decision maker in North Korea. So, you know, it's, it's worth a try in my view. Um, I wish that that whole process had been a little bit better prepared and orchestrated, and maybe it would have had a little bit more satisfactory result. But you know, I think you have to be creative and you have to be willing to try new things. And we need for that uh, strong leadership from government uh, because there'll be critics always, you know, to engaging with uh, someone like Kim Jong-un, who's a very, you know, odious character, frankly. And it's hard for a democracy like the United States, uh, you know, democratically elected government to, to engage uh, with someone like that in a negotiation where you might have to eventually compromise with that person and it's it's not popular so um you know we need the courage of our leaders to to take us there i think right now north korea is undergoing some kind of uh you know outbreak fairly severe by some accounts of covid19 they certainly don't have any uh, preparation or supplies or uh, health care system that could deal with it. And I think this might be a moment where we could try again to offer some humanitarian assistance and see if that could open the door a bit of North Korea to try to get a process going again, where we actually have some communication lines open to the government in North Korea. But it'll be a long uh, road uh, before we get any progress. And with so many failures uh, in the record, it's really hard to overcome all the mistrust that's been built up over the years. 
I'm glad you brought up that issue because I was going to ask you, uh, what do you make of North Korea suddenly going public with a COVID outbreak more than two years uh, since the start of lockdowns? Um, we know how isolated this country is on the world stage. Uh, how did it get to this point? Um, where yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to say what's going on in North Korea. <laughs> sure. um, but I do think, you know, there's people that have questioned from the beginning North Korea's assertion that they don't have any cases of COVID, although they did lock down pretty quickly from China when the Wuhan outbreak happened. And I think the fact that they're coming out now publicly, both in their own state media to their own public, but also in English language media to the outside world. Uh, this is something that usually happens when North Korea wants to restart some kind of engagement process with the outside world. And um, I guess we can only hope that, you know, after a couple or more years of being pretty much isolated from the outside, that they have decided for whatever reason, probably domestic internal reasons or Kim Jong-un's you know, own reasons for regime security that they need to reach out and try to start a process with the outside world. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, this is a pattern that we've seen in the past. North Korea is always in the driver's seat on when you're going to be able to talk to them. They, they don't succumb to any kind of pressure. I mean, it's all on their timetable and they're in control. So hopefully this means that they want to sit down and talk um, maybe we can get, you know, all the UN agencies were kicked out of North Korea because of the COVID restrictions, and we haven't had people on the ground there uh, for quite some time. So hopefully this might be a way to get uh, people back in. I think there are probably uh, pretty dire uh, situations in the country with respect to food, which we've seen in the past. And sometimes this is a way of starting you know, a conversation that hopefully this time could lead somewhere more positive than in the past. One final question in our remaining minutes. If you could round up all of the leaders across Asia in one room, what would you say to them? Tolerance. <laughs> uh, we really need to avoid what I, see as a kind of a growing trend toward uh, re-emphasis on nationalism and stoking kind of, um, for political purposes, stoking kind of fear of the other. And it's not just in Asia, but, um, you know, in Asia, it's a potentially potent and toxic uh, mix. And we've seen some of this already happening, for example, in Myanmar, with the expulsion and the and the sort of murder and um, crimes against humanity for the Rohingya population, um, it's really tempting in politics today to stoke fear and to try to blame others um, because of I think partly the social media environment is fairly toxic and gives free reign to a lot of. Uh, bile in society that that you know used to be not so easy to spread so quickly and I think today um, responsible leadership is called for and um, you know leaders need to be courageous and brave and they need to lead opinion uh, they shouldn't be afraid of politics um, they need to do the right thing Susan, thank you so much for spending time with us. Really appreciate you being here. Good to be with you, Bruce. Thanks.